Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'll be talking with Jesse Felder of The Felder Report. We'll talk about his take long term to short term about technology and the overall relationship between stocks and other assets. What sort of upside or downside potential do we have in this space? A lot of movement, some counter trend reactions to talk about today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts. The stock charts platform was really empowered or designed to empower investors to use the technical analysis toolkit to better understand the markets around them, to better identify opportunities to better manage risk versus reward. And with people like John Murphy and Martin Pring and Larry Williams and Arthur Hill and Tom Boley and many others helping uh, us grow the platform over time, we've really created, I think, a thriving community of uh, investors focused on the technical trends and focused on the charts. And we hope to highlight some of those charts on the move on our show today. We have a great guest today. Jesse Felder has been a, a frequent guest on the uh, on the show. Always brings some interesting charts. And what, what I think about with uh, with Jesse are those, some of the longer term charts that help you put the current movements into proper context. We'll dig into that a little bit. But let's start today by going into our market recap. Let's talk about what happened in the markets today and look at some of the movements and rotations we may have observed. The major average is having a pretty decent day of it. Now, a lot of that came sort of into the uh, sort of one to two o'clock hour from there, sort of settling down a bit, but quite a nice move to the upside for, um, you know, for markets that have been struggling in some cases to move higher. Places like the Nasdaq just sort of continuing to press this upside bet. Uh, you see some of the, the uh, FANG names or what I call the Menomina stocks for the most part, having a pretty decent day of it and, and just the latest up move uh, within the context of a fairly strong 2023. What happened today is sort of the other stuff, right? Things like the Dow members, which have often been sort of flat to down while the Nasdaq's been a little bit higher, sort of everything moving uh, higher. Uh, again, not not dramatically so, but certainly an impressive up move relative to some of the, the, uh, the, the uh, choppy sideways action we've seen. The Nasdaq Composite finishing up about 1.3%, right above 12,500. The S&P 500 just below 4,160. That's up 1.2% uh, from yesterday's close. Mid caps and small caps both up. And we talked about the weakness in small caps, I feel like many times so far year to date. Today, small caps, you heard it here first, leading the way to the upside, up 2.4%. That's the S&P 600 uh, small cap index. So nice move higher. Again, in a lot of ways, if you look at the charts of some of the small cap uh, stocks or some of the main benchmarks like the S&P 600 or the IWM, which is a Russell 2000 ETF, this is a nice move off of some pretty depressed levels. But nice to see a move higher in an area of the market that's been struggling quite, uh, quite some bit. The volatility sort of uh, you know, uh, tapering off a bit after yesterday, we sort of moved to the upside very quickly. The VIX back below 17, finishing the day just below 1690. Other asset classes here, the yield curve overall moving higher, sort of that mid part of the curve, the five-year, 10-year point having the biggest move to the upside. 10-year yields finishing the day right around 3.6%. Same to be said for the 10-year yield, just to click below the, uh, the five-year point. Uh, bond prices, of course, going down. The TLT was down by about a third of a percent. The dollar index not having a huge update, but just up about 0.2%, and that's using the uh, UUP ETF. Looking at commodities, a bit of a mixed bag. The commodity ETF DBC, which we often track, was up about 1.2%. The only two contracts or two uh, commodity ETFs that we track on our front page here uh, that were down, gold down about a third of a percent, corn down almost 2%. So that gold move, again, is sort of continuing this rotation lower. The GLD year-to-date still having a pretty decent 2023, don't get me wrong, but in the last week or two, starting to roll over uh, quite a bit. Testing support levels, you know, I think bringing into question whether this, you know, big strong uptrend that we've seen through much of the year is still in place, uh, pulling off a little bit today. Cryptocurrencies all in the green, and that went up from a little bit up uh, with Ethereum up 0.3% to 1830. 
to Bitcoin up about 1.4% to 27,400. Nice jump higher. They sort of rotated higher very, very quickly once the equity market opened and you saw some strength uh, out of the uh, the opening session. Market sort of calming down yesterday it was the uh, jitters about the debt ceiling. It certainly felt like going into the close today, sort of alleviating that with uh, with uh, risk assets in general, including equities. And I would group cryptocurrencies in as, uh, as well. Having a nice reaction move to the upside. Just very quickly, let's look at the sector movements. We had a great conversation yesterday with uh, Danielle Shea from Simpler Trading here in the studio. We talked in particular about the consumer space, some of the charts within the XLY. XLY leading the way higher today, up over 2%. Financials right up there with it. So talk about two very different sectors in very different sort of trend phases, both ha having a pretty decent day. That shows you what a broad sort of move it was to the upside. Energy, third from the top, up almost 2% as well. Now, financials and energy, of course, besides things like insurance companies, which have been doing pretty well uh, over time, sort of banks and others and energy, a lot of the energy space, like oil services we've talked about recently, uh, all, all having a pretty pretty tough uh, go of it here in uh, in recent months. But nice move to the upside uh, today, You know, having a nice reaction move higher. Some defensive things at the bottom of the list. The only two sector ETFs uh, that were in the red today were the utility sector down about 0.3%. Uh, and also consumer staples, which were essentially flat for the day. H healthcare and uh, materials just a little bit above there as well. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500. I'd like to go here next and just sort of see where we're at. So a nice move higher. Again, does this really change the character of this chart? I don't think so. Does it certainly show that we're seeing a short-term um, you know, uh, bounce out of this range we've been in for the last couple of weeks? Uh, potentially. Uh, and, I, and I would say this thick green line that I've put, in, and as I mentioned a number of times, I, anytime I make the trend line thicker and thicker, that's sort of my... Um, my, my uh, casual way of stressing the importance of certain levels probably in my work because the more I, I use charts as a workbook, it's like a conversation you have with the market. And I tend to draw a lot of lines on my charts. A lot of my, my normal charts that I use in my own investing look a lot more like this when I try to keep the charts clean on the air as much as I can. But you know, my own charts are, tend to be pretty busy with a lot of notes and a lot of drawn uh, signals and a lot of ranges and stuff. And when something's really important that I don't want to miss, I make the line thicker and thicker and I make it a bolder color. And that's just so it jumps out at me. And I remember no matter what, keep an eye on this level. And what usually happens right after I make the line this thick is I set a price alert and say, stock charts tell me when the S&P breaks above 4,200. So just in case I'm not looking at this chart at that particular moment, I get the heads up and I can, uh, I can follow it. So I think S&P 4,200 is pretty important, right? We set that in February of this year. Um, we essentially retested that at the end of uh, April with the shooting star candle that popped up to uh, to that level and then traded back down. Again, I think if and when we get above 4,200, I think that opens the door certainly to much further upside potential, but we're not there yet. For now, we're sort of still within this uh, range. But the more days you have like today, I think the more encouraging this market starts to, uh, to look. One of the issues we've had with a lot of areas, things like small caps, you just haven't had you know, big moves like this. And, and the overall trend has been so much more consistently uh, negative. With that in mind, let's look at a couple breadth indicators. Uh, we talked about breadth a little bit earlier in the week, and I might just sort of press that conversation just to continue it, because I think breadth indicators are really helpful to help validate or invalidate what you're seeing with some of the, high, the top level indexes, right? The S&P 500 value is one number that is comprising 500 individual stocks and all of their different paths all combined into one thing. And I think there's value in that. There's a simplicity in just thinking of the market as that thing and watching how that's evolving. But I think the next level sort of underneath the hood is looking at breadth indicators, looking at sectors and groups, looking at individual stocks, using scans to really understand what the, all the names that comprise the S&P and outside of that uh, index, what they're doing. We talked about this earlier in the week. I wanted to point out that as of today's open, so this is not updated for today's close just yet, these advanced decline lines all tipped lower yesterday. We don't have today's sort of bounce uh, registered just yet. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to bring this up is as of yesterday, three of these four very clearly below their 50-day moving average, one of them testing the 50-day, and that's the S&P's advanced decline line. So large cap AD line, mid cap AD line at the bottom is the small cap AD line. And at the very top is the New York Stock Exchange, sort of the broadest universe uh, of them all. And that's sort of in the middle, very similar to mid caps. You can see large caps have looked a lot stronger than uh, small caps using this breadth indicator, particularly if you look at where we're at 
relative to the February peak, right? The smaller you get, the more of a downtrend it's been in. But look at how all of them were below or, or, or very close to below their 50-day moving average as of yesterday. Today, we'll get a bounce higher, most likely, in all of those. Uh, so I think that's worth seeing, especially in the small cap breadth with a nice update for, uh, for small caps. Now, having said that, yesterday is this bar here. This is looking at the S&P 500 on a daily uh, bar chart. Then below that, it's the advancing stocks on the New York Stock Exchange as a percentage of the total listings, and then the declining stocks as the percentage of the total listings. So today, 76% of the S&P closed higher, 23% of the index uh, declined or, or closed lower. Compare that to yesterday, which was literally the opposite, about 78% uh, we're actually declining, and only about 20, 22 percent were uh, were advancing yesterday. So yesterday's down day flips right over, and you have today's up day, and that shows you that relationship between the two. One other one that I wanted to just to, to show, just to spur your thinking, my my breadth list, along with most of my chart list, they sort of get into this cavernous list of things that I sort of pepper on there, um, charts that are important that I want to follow, and and uh, and I rarely refer to them on the air. They're sort of the the ones I never never get to. But I wanted to bring this up just as a as fruit for thought. This is looking at the correlation between the S&P 500 and its advanced decline line. And what you would imagine if you look at these trends over time, they look very, very similar, right? The values are different, but the directional trend is very, very similar. And that makes sense. When the market's going higher, when the S&P is going higher, it makes sense that there are more advancers than decliners. And when the market's going lower, it makes sense that more stocks are going down than going up. But look at the correlation, which in general tends to be very, very strongly positively correlated. What's happened in the last month or so is this reading has become lower and lower. It's still positively correlated, but much less so. What this means is there's starting to be this disconnect with the major index doing one thing and the advanced decline line doing something different. What's happening is the S&P is essentially staying sideways while the advanced decline line on the S&P 500 is rotating lower. That's because a lot of individual names, some of the smaller mid-cap names within the S&P 500 are starting to roll over, uh, but those mega-cap names that are the biggest weight in the S&P are holding up. I don't know if there's a real direct uh, play for this. I was looking back at some of the previous times when the correlation has gone down. It's been a mixed bag. Sometimes it's been when the market has gone higher and the breadth has come down. Other times when the market's actually come down and the, and the advanced decline line has gone up. Um, but it shows you there's that disconnect and it shows you there's a different experience depending on which area of the S&P you've owned. Your year has been pretty good or maybe not so good. Let's uh, take a quick break. We'll be back with Jesse Felder of the Felder Report. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. So appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. It's a pleasure to put, you, put it on for you and doing it from the studio here in uh, Redmond, Washington. A couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Jesse Felder. First off, we're going to do a mailbag later in this week on Friday's show, and we'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. We'll be getting some really thoughtful questions. Please keep them coming. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. And we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We would love to hear from you. We'll hope to answer your question live on the air on Friday's show. Upcoming guest tomorrow on Thursday the 18th, we have Jeff Hirsch. He's a portfolio manager at Probabilities Fund Management and editor of the Stock Traders Almanac. We'll ask him about this whole sell in May and go away thing and see what he's thinking in 2023. Next week on Tuesday the 23rd, Doug Bush of Chart Smarter coming to us from uh, New York, from Brooklyn. And then on Wednesday the 24th, Andrew Thrasher, founder of Thrasher Analytics, a portfolio manager as well, uh, really does some thoughtful work on social media, sharing some ideas and, uh, and deep data on market history. We'll see what charts and ideas he is thinking about these days. Let's uh, bring on today's guest, Jesse Felder. Jesse's the founder and editor of The Felder Report, coming to us live from Sedona, Arizona. Jesse, great to see you. Welcome back to the show. Always good to chat with you, Dave. Thanks for having me. No, I appreciate it. We were talking before we went live just about the overall conditions. You got some interesting charts with us talking about maybe still a little bit of exhaustion, but we want to start with the relationship between stocks and bonds. We have your quarterly chart of the Qs versus the TLT. Can you talk us through this one and what it's telling you here? Yeah, this is just a super long-term chart. I, I like to sometimes look at these quarterly charts um, because they give you such a good big picture. And this just is comparing the NASDAQ 100 to the uh, the long bond ETF. And you can see that you know, while we've had a good rally in NASDAQ, we haven't gotten back to those highs from late in 2021. But the ratio has made a new all-time high. 
Mm. And that tells me that you know, relative to the bond market, stocks have been very, very strong. And actually, they've gotten to a level of overbought in terms of RSI on this 14 quarter RSI that we, we don't see too often. Um, and when we have seen this in the past, it's usually led to some sideways action for stocks. I think stocks have a hard time making significant upside headway when they become overbought relative to bonds. And basically, mm. another way to think about this is that stocks, you know, essentially need lower interest rates, perhaps, in order to power another major leg higher in the bull market. Yeah, really, really interesting. And the, the way you set up this chart is actually brilliant. And I'm as I'm looking at this more and hearing you describe it, Jesse, I'm, I'm getting the sense of what you did. So the line is actually showing the ratio of the Qs versus the TLT. You can see that making a new high, but the bars in the background are actually the Qs, just the quarterly uh, bars, right? Correct. Yeah. Beautiful. And then I see the momentum at the bottom there. Really, really interesting. It's interesting to look back at some of those overbought conditions uh, going back here over time. Let's get into technology a little bit more. We're looking at the NASDAQ 100 here. This is the weekly chart. What is this telling you at this point? So, you know, and I, I, I really enjoyed looking at your charts and I probably would have coded the, the, the technicals on the top part of the chart mm. with one of your colored uh, rectangles rather than the two bars. I think yep. that would make more <laughs> sense because it really looks to me like more of like a resistance range rather than, you know, any hard, firm, horizontal resistance there. Mm. But we're kind of right in this range between whatever it is, 12,900 and 13,700 or something like that on the NASDAQ 100, which has kind of been a, an important congestion area uh, in the past. What the nine on the chart there, and, and I think with these next two charts, I, I'd like to highlight two of the the techniques or indicators that I that I really like to use in assessing the strength of overall trends, the nine there represents the first, and that's a, a DeMarc sequential um, cell setup that completed last week. And, and uh, the way that a cell setup works is you essentially need a closing price that's higher than the price uh, closing price four bars previous. When you get nine of those in a row, that's a pretty song, strong, you know, sign of an uptrend. That usually the ninth one is the completion of the cell setup. And a lot of times those nines can be good cell signals in and of themselves. They've been especially good on the weekly chart of Apple. Um, mm. They've kind of marked important intermediate term trading points. But what's interesting about this one is it comes in the midst of this kind of horizontal resistance area. And when you look at the momentum indicator that I put here on the chart, I use PPO. This is a technique that I learned from uh, Michael Oliver, who runs mm -hmm. Momentum Structural Analysis. And essentially, this indicator just shows price relative to the 40-week moving average, which is the moving average that's up on the, uh, the upper half of the chart. And you can see that you know during that post-pandemic uptrend on the left half of the chart, momentum stayed in a range above kind of this seven and a half area. And that was a very clear uh, indicator that momentum was was uh, stable above that area, that you're in a very clear uptrend. You can see right at the end of 2021, we broke down below that seven and a half area. And that was a, that was kind of a clear sign. Momentum had shifted from uptrend to downtrend. And now we've remained below that really since, uh, you know, early 2022, um, you know, through that bear market phase. And now we're kind of testing that area from below. And I would, I, you know, basically, I would look at this as if it were able to break back above that. That is a clear sign and shift from from uh, intermediate term downtrend to uptrend again. If we're unable to break above that, then uh, you know that would be a sign that we we remain in an intermediate term downtrend. I, and we've talked about this before, Jesse. I've, I've I've used the Demarc indicators heavily at parts of my my career, and I remember you know something like this: a weekly nine, the setup nine, happening at a previous resistance level or at a previous support level. A lot of times, can be just sort of added weight. I always love to see when it would line up with other sort of methodology. So it's interesting that that's happening right as we're approaching the uh, the August high uh, from last year. Your last chart, then getting into the daily time frame. What's the shorter term view on the Nasdaq here? So yeah, we're just zooming in onto the daily chart here, and we kind of have the same type of indicators. I've marked today we completed a 9.13.9 DeMarc cell signal, um, DeMarc sequential cell signal. So the, we had the 13 cell signal back in March, 
um, which was followed immediately by another nine. And and uh, when I met Tom almost 20 years ago, he said, this is one of the most powerful cell signals in, in this indicator you know, arsenal, mm. that when you do have a, a strong uptrend and you get a 9.13.9, it can be an important uh, indicator of trend exhaustion. To me, the fact that it comes in the midst of what looks to be kind of an ending diagonal or bearish wedge pattern, um, you know, suggests that, you know, it's probably time to, uh, you know, keep a close eye on the uptrend. We could be poised for an important reversal. When you look at the momentum on the lower half of the chart, too, this represents price relative to the 50-day moving average. And since the start of the year, it's been coiling in kind of a mm. pennant pattern. We, you know, today we tested the top edge of that. If we were able to break out of that pennant to the upside, that'd be a clear sign. Maybe we don't need to worry about this type of a reversal. But if we can't break out and we eventually do break down and momentum breaks down out of that pennant pattern, I think it would be a clear sign that this kind of bearish wedge pattern and these other trend exhaustion signals are a sign that perhaps this rally has run its course. It's so interesting. We were talking earlier, uh, of course, looking at in our market recap about the S&P 500. You have a lot of things that are sort of, you know, have had nice runs, but all of a sudden they're facing significant resistance. Apple, you mentioned, comes to mind, you know, sort of trading up to previous highs. So with that in mind, how do you approach now the next, you know, four, six, eight weeks? Is it more defensively minded if this is the sort of exhaustion patterns we're getting? Or how would you manage the potential risk versus the reward here? Yeah, I think I would be um, certainly defensive minded against those big tech stocks that have been the leaders so far in this market. We've had tons of, you know, breath warnings and things over the last, uh, you know, a lot of talk about the weakness in the rest of the market relative to these big stocks, which have essentially been able to hold up the market all on their own. Um, I, you know, there's been a group of stocks that are, I think, are more higher beta names than even the big tech stocks, typically money losing tech stocks that I've been uh, you know, trading from the short side and, you know, I'm looking at things like uh, Tesla and uh, Airbnb, DoorDash mm. uh, is another one um, type of stocks that I think, you know, uh, are potentially good, good uh, short side targets if we are going to see another leg lower in the broad markets. It's interesting how um, the difference between like an Airbnb, between a Tesla, DoorDash, you mentioned a great example, versus the patterns that we've seen in some of those larger names in in uh, in, in technology and communication services and things like that. What about the other areas of the market? Something like financials. We had a day like today where financials, energy, having a nice, what I could best describe as a counter trend move off of the lows. Do you see something to like in an area like that? Or is it sort of a treat this as a, for lack of a better term, dead cat bounce sign sort of situation? What about those areas of the market that have, that have been struggling year to date? Uh, no, I'm, I'm really actually still bullish on energy. I've been, hmm. you know, huge energy bull for three years now, almost three years. I do think, uh, you know, XOP is kind of my favorite ETF in that space. Uh, and ENFR is another one that uh, is energy infrastructure, which is more mm. of kind of an income play. But I do think the oil price looks interesting here um, from a very long term standpoint. I think Katie Stockton pointed out on Twitter that the natural gas price is completing some important um, demark buy signals mm. recently. Um, and, and so I do think energy is really interesting. I think oil, you know, the, the bearishness in oil is essentially the inverse of a lot of the bullishness we're seeing towards, you know, a lot of these AI stocks and things. And so I, I do think uh, there's opportunities in the markets uh, for and a lot of these things, to me, the way I look at them are still in an uptrend and, and the supply demand dynamic for these things. The underlying fundamentals are still very, very bullish. Um, just we only have about 30 seconds left, Jesse, but I'd love to to ask in this sort of situation, particularly with like the debt ceiling debate, there are a lot of sort of macro unknown sort of things happening. What would you tell younger investors? We have a lot of newer investors that are joining the platform and just trying to get comfortable with all this. And then it's sort of an unknown event like that comes on. How do you sort of stay focused or or stay, uh, I guess, I guess, uh, focused on the right opportunities with that sort of uncertainty around us? Well, it's, it's almost impossible to trade, you know, a, an event like that. But I'm watching really closely. I'm watching TLT mm. because when you look at this, the performance of secular stocks within the broad stock market, they're weakening. They're pointing to towards uh, economic recession. You have the copper to gold ratio also kind of suggesting rates should be coming down. Bonds should be rallying. 
The mm. fact that TLT is not able to do that is an important sign to me that I'm paying close attention to. Jesse, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for bringing some charts with you. Thanks for letting me ask some random questions along the way as well. Be well, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon, all right? Thanks, Dave. That's Jesse Felder. Jesse's the founder and editor of the Felder Report, coming to us from Sedona, Arizona. Although I think at heart, he is a Pacific Northwesterner uh, based in the Oregon area for, uh, for a long time as well. What a pleasure to talk with, uh, with Jesse. And I loved asking him at the end there about how you sort of stay focused. I, I find a lot of people sort of asking about what about the debt ceiling? What about, you know, geopolitical issues? What about this? What about that? And at the end of the day, I found that the discipline of looking at the charts and the trends, some of the potential reversal signs or exhaustion signs, as Jesse was uh, illustrating using some of the DeMarc indicators, really helpful to just focus on the evidence of the markets. Where are you seeing the rotations? Where are you seeing the opportunities? That has uh, has helped me to navigate those waters uh, as well. Great take there, as always, by uh, Jesse Felder, editor of The Felder Report. We have to wrap this show, folks, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. You know, I wanted to start looking at the uh, what I call the Menomina stocks, and we're going to start looking at the New York FANG Plus Index, or the NYSE FANG Plus Index. This is an index that the New York Stock Exchange uh, publishes. It's really the FANG stocks and then some other things, which is why it's called FANG Plus. So, um, you know, things like uh, Twitter, if I remember right, some of the Chinese internet names were in there at one point. I've lost track of what all is included in here, but it's sort of the FANG type of, uh, of stocks. The price, of course, has been fairly consistently strong year to date. It was coming off of a low there, um, retesting the November low at the beginning of the year, but then just a nice rotation to the upside. The relative strength of this index versus the S&P has been consistently strong as well. But I have the uh, what I call the Menomina stocks, Meta, Apple, Netflix, Amazon. You can read the tickers as you go along the left column. But notice on the right, as we go through each one of these, where they are at relative to the 200-day moving average. You have stocks like Meta, and Apple and Alphabet that are far above their 200-day uh, moving average, having a nice trend of it, a uh, nice, nice, uh, nice, nice year, and overall trending well. You have charts like Netflix, which aren't making new highs at the moment, but are sort of rotating back to the upper end of the range and still making higher lows. And then you have names like Amazon, which have really started to rotate uh, higher uh, over the last uh, couple couple weeks, the last couple months. But all eight of those stocks that I mentioned, with Adobe moving higher today, that's the final A in Menomina of those eight stocks, getting above there. That means eight for eight above their 200-day moving average. And while we can debate a lot about narrow leadership and what this group of stocks is doing versus some other groups of stocks and weakening breadth conditions 100%, but one of my, one of my uh, comments would be when all eight of these are above their 200-day, there's no way that the market can be that bad as long as that would continue. So that might be an important chart to watch. That's chart number one. The second chart is looking at Charles Schwab. I liked asking um, uh, Jesse Felder, nice take on energy, which has been you know short-term a little weaker, but longer-term a pretty incredible story uh, in, in some cases. Some of those names have done, have done quite well. What's interesting about the financial space is it's certainly been deteriorating, right? We've talked about the KBE, the KRE, which are the bank ETF and the regional banks ETF, all of them struggling certainly as this sort of uh, you know recent banking crisis became magnified there in early March. And now we're still sort of feeling the ripple effects. I feel like every week we're getting another headline or another story sort of suggesting that we're not quite done. We still need to think about it. But what I'm noticing on the chart, chart of Char Charles Schwab is lows May, April, May, uh, sorry, March, April, May on a closing basis declining. Look at the momentum sloping higher. Every one of those new lows over the last couple months has come on less negative momentum. We're not even making it to the oversold region anymore. This could be a bottom fishing candidate. Boy, let's see if we can get above the 50-day moving average, not too far uh, above current levels. Finally, airlines. Airlines are one of the better groups today. I brought up the chart of Southwest Airlines because a client was asking about it. I couldn't help but notice the lower lows march into May, the higher lows. You're getting some of these bullish momentum divergences. And what they do is they raise a red flag and they, they tell me to put them on a watch list and watch for a break. I'd love to see if this could get above its 50-day as well. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank Jesse Felder of The Felder Report joining us from Sedona, Arizona. All of our previous interviews are at StockChartsTV.com. I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night.